okay so the first technique we're going to visit is the idea of a titration now titration is a method that is used to determine the volume of an acid needed to just neutralize an alkali and it works like this so the first step is that we use a glass pipette to um, very accurately measure a fixed volume of an alkali so here is step one you can see the pipette there and it has labeled on it the volume that it can measure out. So this pipette will very accurately measure exactly 25 centimeters cubed of our alkali. What we then do is we add that alkali to a conical flask with an indicator in it. You can see that is what we've done here. Now importantly, we choose an indicator that only has a single color change. For example, phenylthalene. Now phenylthalene um, in acid, it is colorless. And in an alkali, it is pink. Okay, and and so what we should see as we do our titration is when it's still an alkali, it's bright pink. We keep on adding acid, and it gets more and more neutral, but it still stays pink because it hasn't been fully neutralized yet. And then as soon as it gets neutralized, it suddenly switches to colorless within a single drop, and that gives us a really accurate way to determine the end point of our titration. That's much better than something like Universal Indicator, which would gradually change through a whole range of colors. And it's very difficult to judge the exact right shade uh, of color of, of green where you need to stop the reaction. Now, our next step is that we're going to um, add our acid from a burette. We can see that here. So a burette is this thing. It's essentially sort of like a very long, thin, accurate measuring cylinder with a tap at the bottom there. And as we open the tap, we can gradually add the acid from the burette into the um, conical flask. And we'd be swirling the flask the whole time to make, th make sure things um, stayed nice and mixed. Now, we add the alkali, and so we add the acid until the alkali is just neutralized. So we want to see that sudden color change, in this case, from bright pink to suddenly colorless. At that point, we stop, and then we're going to repeat the titration until we get concordant results. So by concordant results, we mean results that agree within 0.1 centimeters cubed of each other. And so then we can calculate our neutralizing volume, you know, the actual volume of acid needed to neutralize the alkali. That will just be the mean of our concordant results that we get. Okay, so what we're gonna look at now is how we can make a soluble salt from a soluble base. And this will be an application of the titration that we saw on the previous slide. So our first step in this process is to choose our acid and our base. So imagine we were trying to make some sodium chloride. Um, in this case, our acid would be hydrochloric acid because that's needed to make chloride salts. And our soluble base, um, a good example could be sodium hydroxide. We want a sodium base and sodium hydroxide is a soluble um, hydroxide. Now, step two then is to conduct our titration. Now, this is going to work in the same way that we just saw on the previous slide. So we are going to have some acid in our burette. So that's where the hydrochloric acid will be. In our conical flask, we will have our sodium hydroxide and our um, phenylthalein indicator to make it nice and pink. And we're going to add the acid into the um, into the uh, alkali until it just neutralizes. We'll repeat it a few times until we get concordant results. And then here's the difference. We have this step. Once we know exactly what volume of acid to add, we will repeat the titration, but without the indicator, adding exactly the volume that we just determined. And by doing this, we will know that we've exactly neutralized the, um, the alkali because that's what we worked out in the previous step. And by using it without the indicator, that ensures that the sodium chloride is pure and it isn't being contaminated by the indicator. So our last step then is to separate out our sodium chloride um, and we're going to use the method of crystallization. So in crystallization, what we do is we heat our solution in an evaporating basin, that's this one here, um, until crystals form on the surface. And you can see those little white crystals there starting to form on the surface. And at that point then, we will leave the um, evaporating basin in a warm, dry place for that water to fully evaporate. Okay, now we're gonna look at the core, uh, one of the core practicals for the acids topic, which is how we make a soluble salt 
from an insoluble base this time, not a soluble base. So step one, same as last time, is to select the acid and the base we need. So for example, if the salt was going to be copper sul sulfate, then a suitable insoluble base we could use might be copper oxide. There are other possibilities. We could use copper carbonate as well. Um, and because it's a sulfate salt, we've only got one choice of acid. It must be sulfuric acid. Now what we need to do is we need to add the base, what we mean to excess. That means um, that um, all the um, acid gets neutralized. Okay. And some base is left over. Okay. So what we do here is we warm the acid so that it reacts faster. Don't boil it. Boiling acid, never a good thing. We're just going to warm it. Um, and we're going to add a spatula of the base and stir it until it dissolves. You can see that happening here. Um, we're adding the base. We're stirring it. It goes cloudy for a bit. And if it fully dissolves, it stops going cloudy. And we repeat this until the base no longer dissolves, until it stays cloudy. And that means that we've reacted all of the acid away. And so there's no acid left to react with the base. So some of that insoluble base hangs around. And that, that's what makes it cloudy. Step three, then, is to remove the excess base by filtration. So we, we filter this mixture here. And all of our unreacted base, the solid, stays collected in the filter paper. And what passes through is our solution of the soluble salt that we've tried to make. And then to separate it, we do the same thing as on the previous slide. We separate that salt by crystallization. So we heat the filtrate in an evaporating basin until we get these crystals, in this case, nice blue ones of copper sulfate. Those crystals form on the surface. And then we leave it in a warm, dry place for the water to fully evaporate. So we're going to look now at solubility rules, which are some rules that let us determine whether a given salt is soluble or insoluble. Now, just basic definitions. Soluble means that a salt dissolves in water. Insoluble means it does not dissolve in water. And what we find, first of all, is that all common sodium, potassium and ammonium salts are soluble and none of the ones that you will meet are insoluble. Similarly, we find that all nitrates are soluble and again, none of the ones that you will meet are insoluble. We find that most chlorides are soluble, except for silver and lead chlorides. We find that most sulfates are soluble, except for barium sulfate, lead sulfate and calcium sulfate. With carbonates, we find that most carbonates are insoluble, except for sodium, potassium and ammonium carbonates. And that's because of this rule up here about the solubility of those things. And finally, we find that most hydroxides are also insoluble, again, with the exception of sodium, potassium and ammonium hydroxides, because they fall under that top rule as well. Now, linked to our idea of solubility rules, we have the idea of precipitation reactions. Now, a precipitation reaction is a reaction in which two soluble salts react to form an insoluble product. Um, for example, we might have lead nitrate and potassium iodide reacting together to make lead iodide and potassium nitrate. Now, lead iodide um, is an insoluble salt, and so we get this precipitate. Um, and you can see that bright yellow lead iodide being formed there in that reaction. Now, you can always tell a precipitation reaction because they go cloudy. And that cloudiness is tiny particles of the solid insoluble substance that are being formed. So now we need to be able to use our knowledge of solubility rules and of um, precipitation reactions to, to predict will a precipitation reaction take place. Now, to do this, what we do is we determine the potential products. And that's easily done. We just swap their names over. And if one of them is insoluble, then a precipitation reaction will happen. So let's have a little look at that in practice. Um, example number one, then. So we've got silver nitrate and potassium chloride. Now, to, to get our potential products, we just swap over the nitrate and the chloride to make silver chloride and potassium nitrate. Now, if we look up here, we can see that nitrates are always soluble. So that won't precipitate. 
but we can see that although chlorides normally are soluble, silver chloride is insoluble. So that will be our precipitate, and that's why this will lead to a precipitation reaction. Another example, copper chloride and sodium carbonate. So again, to get our potential products, we swap over the uh, names. So our potential products are going to be copper carbonate and sodium chloride. Now, copper carbonate, if we look at the carbonates row, carbonates are generally insoluble. The ones that aren't, sodium, ammonium and potassium carbonate, but this is copper carbonate. So copper carbonate is insoluble. Um, let's look at the sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is both a chloride and a sodium salt, so we're very confident that that is soluble. So in this case, it is going to be our copper carbonate that is going to be our insoluble precipitate, and that will make that reaction go cloudy. So what about some non-examples? Let's look at potassium sulfate and ammonium chloride. Now, if we start by swapping the names around, okay, our potential products would be potassium chloride, And the other one would be um, uh, ammonium um, uh, sulfate. Now, if we look at our solubility table, potassium chloride is a potassium salt, so it is soluble. That won't precipitate. Uh, and ammonium sulfate is an ammonium salt, so it is also soluble and it won't precipitate either. So when we mix potassium sulfate and ammonium chloride, we will get no reaction because precipitation doesn't happen. That's what that red X is doing. That's showing us there's no reaction. And last example is ammonium carbonate and sodium chloride. So um, again, look at the potential products, swap our anions over. So we end up with ammonium chloride is one potential one. Now we've seen already ammonium salts up here are always soluble, so that won't precipitate. And our other possibility is sodium carbonate. Um, you might see where this is going already. Because it's a sodium salt, it is always going to be soluble, so it won't precipitate either. So again, we get a red X because this won't react. There won't be a precipitation reaction because all of our potential products are still soluble. Now, finally, what we can do is combine everything we've just seen about solubility to look at how we can prepare an insoluble salt. So step one, similar to our other experiments, is to choose a suitable salt. So let's say, for example, um, we were trying to make some silver chloride. Some suitable salts to make that from would be sodium chloride, because it is soluble, and silver nitrate, because it is also soluble. And when they react with each other, they'll make that insoluble silver chloride. So what we then do is we mix our solutions and stir well, really easy, and that will instantly go cloudy, and that cloudiness is tiny particles of the solid precipitate, our insoluble salt that we are trying to make. Um, so step three, really easy, we just filter it, and we can see here are the particles of our precipitate. Um, they'll get caught in the filter paper, so all we do then is we rinse the filter paper by adding a small amount of distilled water. What that will do is that will make sure that any soluble contamination goes through the filter and doesn't get um, collected in the filter paper. And then finally, we just leave the filter paper in a warm, dry place uh, until it is fully dried. And that's it. That's how we prepare our insoluble salt. So there we are. Uh, the end. As always, thank you for listening and well done if you got this far.